Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with us here today, be sure to hit the subscribe button, follow me on Twitter, go to Focus Compounding, sign up for the website. I'm just like naming everything. Mm -hmm. Go to quickfs.net, which is the website we use to demo out and pull all of the financial data. Uh, but we do use it every single day ourselves. And of course, if you are uh, interested in our money management services, either through the managed accounts or you're a qualified investor and you're interested in the fund, uh, reach out to me, Andrew, at focusedcompounding.com. So in today's podcast, we are going to do our lesson podcast. So that's the new schedule. I okay. think a lot of people like it. I like it. Uh, we have one that's on the markets. It's good for the views. And honestly, I love talking about macro stuff with you because it's so okay. interesting to hear how it factors into your investing process and things you're thinking through. Um, uh, so we got you know more news related stuff, timely stuff. We got timeless content, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then we we'll do a snap judgments or a Q&A. So be on the lookout for that. You could go to my Twitter at Focus Compound. I'll tweet out uh, that we're doing a call for questions because it's always good to hear what's on everybody's mind. So customer behavior, something we care a lot about. You know what's fascinating? I hear, I read write-ups a lot of times. Like I was thinking about this last night because I was reading a write-up on Value Investors Club. And very rarely do I come across a write-up where it talks about like the business from the perspective of like really understanding the business, like really understanding the competitive advantages, why customers use it, what the alternatives are, like really understanding it. It seems like it's very much always kind of like financial engineering, like uh, mm -hmm. the stock pick. It's very much like, well, I think it, you could get this multiple flip or you could get this short term puff, you know, stuff like that. I'm talking like really understanding the business and the customers from the perspective of, you know, something you would probably care about if you were going to buy the entire business yourself. Um, Value Investors Club is more catalysts, but more even other situations. I feel like. So it's a lot of like comps and things like that. That's how it started. That's kind of what you can be a stock market genius has in it. It's a lot more numbers based is what I'm mm -hmm. saying, you know, yeah. as opposed to the Phil Fisher approach of right. doing that type of scuttlebutt. And, um, you know, so I think it's fascinating and we could talk about customer behavior, just go over a few different things. And you have once said, once you understand a company's customer behavior, you'll have a solid understanding of the business. And what goes into that is how do customers see the product? Why do they use it? How do they search for alternatives? And my favorite, which I think is probably one of the best questions you can ask a company if you're going to speak to them, is if a competitor offers to sell its product for 5% less, how do they respond? Mm -hmm. So do they lower their prices to compete right. on price? Do they have, you know, such mind share where they don't care? What do they do? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's interesting. And a lot of people like to ask, how do we kind of get these takeaways from the research? Right. And we've done podcasts before where we've talked about, you know, little subtle hints that they'll give in the 10K. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of wanted to do a review on it. Um, so almost every company includes price as a competitive factor in their 10K. They compete on price. Mm -hmm. If they do not say this in the, the competition standpoint, that's something that should stand out to you. That's something mm -hmm. that jumps out at me and something that jumps out at you because pretty much every single company competes on price in some fashion. So if they're saying that they don't, well, that's something that's pretty interesting. Usually when that's the case, do you think it's more regional? Um, do you think it's more on the customer experience? I mean, you think about banks, right? Two banks can operate in the same right. town and have the same market share year after year. Mm -hmm. And people just don't care to switch if one bank's offering a higher amount of interest on the, de on, you know, the deposits or whatever. So some industries are like that where they're kind of weird like that. Yeah. I think more opaque pricing, um, longer sales cycle, things like that. Sometimes they'll mention competing on other things instead of price. There's some industries where there's little price competition. Mm -hmm. So we've listed these before, but we'll do a little recap. Um, certain phrases that you could look out for. Uh, if a company says like a limited number of competitors, they have relatively high barriers to entry, or they compete primarily on factors other than price are ones that stick out. Um, some companies, and this is a good way to, to see if, you know, the industry is consolidated. Maybe there's a couple big players. Uh, they'll just list them, right? Mm -hmm. And 
sometimes it's like there, you don't need to read between the lines. Like I remember this is back to like, I don't know, 2018. And I was asking you, well, I think the company was listing their largest customers. And I asked you, well, how do you know which is the biggest blah, blah, blah. And you're like, honestly, a lot of times in 10 Ks, if they list like what their biggest customers are, it mm-hmm. probably like the first one listed is probably yeah. their largest customer all the way down. Yep. Unless there's some other logic to why they're doing it. That's usually true. It's usually true for factors that they say that it, these are the reasons why this happened. The things that they list first are the biggest contributors and the things that they list last are the least. Not always 100% true in 10Ks, but there's no other logic to why they order them a certain way. In any sentence, usually the things in the beginning are the biggest and the things at the end of the sentence are the smallest factors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the most useful information is when a company gives information about market share brand names and competitive strategy. Mm -hmm. And I think the best example of this, a recent one that we've talked about, we use it on the podcast a lot is us lime. Right. And I highlighted, uh, the parts that stuck out to you from your write up on focus compounding. Uh, and if you're watching on the screen, you could see it, but if you're listening, the parts that are highlighted, the competition section is, it says lime industry is highly regionalized and competitive with price quality, ability to meet customer demands and specifications proximity to customers, personal relationships, and timeliness of deliveries being the prime competitive factors. The company's competitors are predominantly private companies. Um, And then they go on to say that the lime industry is characterized by high barriers to entry, required zoning and permitting is important, the need for lime plants and facilities to be located close to markets, which is interesting. They say that they compete principally on a regional basis. And then about the industry perspective, they actually list out says consolidation in the lime industry has left the three largest companies accounting for more than two thirds of North American production capacity. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of information that they gave about like the overall structure of the industry. And a lot of it's very unusual. So uh, obviously proximity to the customer is somewhat unusual, high, um, uh, low value to weight, high weight to value. Uh, things that happens with um, a lot of great details in there. For instance, one that they didn't make a huge point of, but they give you a little bit about is the permitting. I think that's a major factor in the industry because when I can find things, there's government sources that you can find every year for this. Um, it seems like people are using the fact that they have a permit to expand an existing site versus um, having uh, additional sites and things like that. There's just some evidence, I think, that once something's up and permitted and all of those sorts of things, that that is kind of um, leads to more and more investment in that uh, than investment over time in more sites. So you have more production from fewer sites over time. Um, And then one that's very unusual. um, So timeliness of deliveries is very important. I I mentioned like George Risk before and things like that, customization, timeliness, things like that. They just a brief mention that because of COVID, uh, they basically had a competitor that's out of business. And that's happened to them because their competitors went offshore and they've, you know, over the last, you know, 15 years or whatever, they've all basically been wiped out by that decision. Um, because, you know, COVID with the supply chain thing that just for some competitors, they'll never come back from that. So you need to be in the, you know, in the United States, in the middle of the country, it's easier to do that. So anyone that says proximity to customers and timeless enough deliveries, that's a very big factor. Um, foreign competition is going to have a very hard time with you. But then, one that's very strange here, they say price, quality, ability to meet customer demands is interesting. You see that sometimes. Um, but personal relationships is almost never mentioned. And it's mentioned here. Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting that they did that. So, And they have like a 20-person sales team, I believe, which yeah. I thought was interesting. And if you go back and to I the oldest... The top people are really salespeople too mm-hmm. is my guess i yeah. don't know all the details on that but a lot of times i think people who are listed as like executives are actually just salespeople. yeah i went back to the oldest 10k on edgar and they had even whatever 15 years ago a 20 person sales team as well so i thought that was interesting because mm-hmm. the business has obviously grown a well lot. i don't know that their co- number of customers has grown by all that much though of course because that's what they're saying with the personal relationships and also mm-hmm. there's just tendency for the same customer to use you over and over again obviously but a re- you know a relationship yeah um yeah there what i meant there is there's some companies um cement companies are the same way and stuff where if they show someone as being um in charge of a plant or something they may also be someone who's really responsible for bringing in large new customers that part of their job is being a salesman yeah mm-hmm. got it so Another interesting example is 
you know, certain ways that they word things sometimes in a 10K that could seem bad, but as actually a source of their competitive advantage. And I believe this is from Village. Mm -hmm. They may say that because customers are unwilling to drive more than five to 15 minutes as a risk factor, and it is difficult to find locations with sufficient parking, their growth may be constrained by the lack of available places to put a new supermarket. And you had written that you could look at that as a limitation to the company's growth, but really see that it's actually a barrier to entry. Right. Any limitation to the company's growth is usually a barrier to entry for others. In fact, in many cases, it's much more of a problem for others than it is for them um, that are already in the industry. So a great example of that is compliance stuff. So, you know, Facebook tells you it'll cost us incredible amounts of money to comply with all these rules and stuff. Well, no one else can possibly comply with them. So that's a huge advantage. You know, Western Union warns about that stuff and companies like that, you know, where they talk about how much they have to go into for how many lawsuits they have over not having customers and know your customer stuff and all these things. It's very hard for anyone else to comply with those things if they're smaller, obviously. Um, Of course, this did turn out to be a risk with Village because they then went out and bought things in somewhat different markets and like Maryland and New York and stuff, which were less successful. So they acquired because they couldn't grow organically. I think some organic growth is sort of a safety valve stopping companies from um, doing dumb things, doing acquisitions and things like that. Yeah. That aren't that smart. Yeah. Go ahead. They didn't, they don't buy back their stock and stuff like that. So they paid a dividend, um, but the dividend wasn't sufficient to like completely um, soak up all their, you know, all, all their capital. So they also did acquisitions. Yeah. The best type of niche is a local one. Yes. Why do you like local businesses? I mean, is that just the nature of the size of the companies that we're focusing on? No. No. A local advantage is by far the best advantage you can have in business. Because of the mind share? No, because if it's not local, if it's globally traded, then someone can be created anywhere else in the world to compete with you and can have different factors in terms of labor could be cheaper there. There could be easier access to capital there. Um, You know, like, for instance, say the United States is one of the best places in the world for business X. Okay. It could be better than 170 countries in the world, but if there are 10 countries in the world that have an advantage over you, then those countries could compete with you and they could beat you on that. So, uh, you know, local. Okay. Um, if you're operating a local restaurant where people have to eat there, okay, how are they going to compete with me by the fact that people in Vietnam make less wages than the United Mm -hmm. States? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, and closer to local is a, a benefit even in other ones, like when I was, you know, so even talking about something like George risk or something, that's a benefit versus totally global business. Some things that are, have to be pretty timely and stuff. Like there's some clothing things and stuff that focus on, you would use the Dominican Republic, but you would never use Asia. Whereas Hamilton beach brands, uh, which is, you know, where you got your toasters and your crock pots, you'll do that from all over the world because it's not as important, the timeliness of it and all of that. So it's not as big a risk um, to your, that your supply chain is less reliable that way. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that a local niche is definitely the best one. Um, and it can become incredibly dominant due to local economies of scales. Um, you know, local niche would be like Nebraska Furniture Mart in Omaha, mm-hmm. which basically took over the whole market. They ended up like growing the size of the market and everything basically beyond what people would have guessed it could have been. So that's the biggest advantage. Yeah. Buffett lives like what? All of two minutes away from that location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think lime's a better business than, um, you know, than gold or oil or something because it's going to be, um, less likely to be traded. Yeah. Globally. Even things like timber and stuff, I would prefer if you're going to invest in commodity to invest in a commodity that's not going to be transported um, globally. And even with cement and lime, um, I would much prefer owning a plant in the middle of the country than owning one near a port because you can, or a river, because you can move by barge and stuff. So you will have some competition if you have a cement plant in Los Angeles, but you won't have that competition if you had it in Omaha. So you'd rather be in Omaha. Mm. A good place to learn about industries, uh, S1s. You don't hear a lot of people talking about that, but typically in S1s, they really try to describe the industry because they're yeah. really selling the you know, the business, right? Mm-hmm. They talk about the industry, the competitors, stuff like that. You could find customers and then, of course, 10Ks. Uh, but if you read the 10Ks of a lot of the companies in the industry or the larger players, you could definitely learn a lot about the industry and the positioning as well. Yeah, I would caution most people to avoid thinking as much about the competition, think more about customers 
and what the company is doing and how it's a different business model than some competitors. But I think most write-ups I read focus way too much on competition, on who the competitors are. Oh, is the R a little bit better than theirs or whatever? That do doesn't really matter. If your ad agency is a little better than their ad agency, it just matters who the customers are or how you're serving them, what the business model is. And if it's good, there's room enough for lots of other people to be in that. Um, whereas having the best competitive position in a lousy industry isn't going to help you unless you're delivering a lot of value for your um, customer and you have a lot of bargaining power with that customer. And likewise, with suppliers and labor and all of those sorts of things, it's, you know, fish, um, Porter's five forces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's bringing it back to if a competitor offers to sell its product for 5% less, how do they respond? Right. What, I mean, how would you judge customer behavior then outside of that? Is it actually going out to see the way that people react with it? Is it just trying to understand why they use it? I mean, like, let's talk about, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, nuclear reactors, right? right? You understand what nuclear reactors do, but I mean, what was your thought well, process when thinking about like their customers and stuff? Sure. So they have reports that they put out, um, that there's lots of different information about it, but like, um, uh, sometimes it's GAO things and stuff like that. I think GAO reports are really good. Um, in terms of giving you a lot of information, there can be reports, for government things that are requested by different members of Congress and different departments and things to look into a certain industry. But uh, also just planning for, you know, what the Navy is planning and what they care about a lot. And um, connected to that, there's there's different sort of, they're not trade publications, but there's different sorts of um, media that covers things about armed forces, things about uh, the defense industry and, you know, what they're doing. Um, uh, you know, so that one I think is fairly easy to understand what the customer would want in the modern day. I think it would have been very hard, like I said before, if you were trying to make the decision in the 50s and stuff, when they were really looking at competing totally different designs and stuff from different um, companies. But once, the, you know, the nuclear Navy had been around for a really long time, then I think you understood. Hmm. Other ones is a little bit harder, but they're smaller parts of the business. So, you know, if you don't know as much about the nuclear weapons thing or, or stuff like that that they have. Um, but a lot of that was done through consortiums and things like that, so. Why do you think certain people choose like insurance companies? Is it based on the pricing, based on Depends. sort of the mind share, based on? Do we want to get this technical and stuff about it? I mean, it it's completely different. Insurance company stuff is completely different depending on what kind of insurance you're talking about and how it's distributed. There's like no similarities. So for instance, why are Geico and Progressive and stuff great businesses? It's just because it's auto insurance. It doesn't work in other kinds of insurance the same way. They wouldn't have the same advantages. So auto insurance, basically in the United States, the government's going to force you to have some sort of auto insurance. So you have to have it. But on the other hand, um, you didn't really want it. You have some things where you care a little bit about it, but it's a requirement that you have to have. You see it as an expense. So you're very focused on price you're much less focused on actually wanting to protect yourself from this event. Um, so you're much less concerned about the capacity of the um, company to pay under different circumstances. You're not a sophisticated person in terms of understanding uh, the safety of the different insurance companies and things like that. You probably don't understand much about the insurance except in sort of um, boilerplate sort of ways, but then regulators may encourage companies to use the same sort of things. So you may understand the difference between comprehensive and then just the minimum liabilities and things like that, but it's not a highly customized sort of insurance. So it's very easy to have huge scale advantages. You're not going to say, oh, I'd love to go with you, Geico, but I need you to change the language uh, in section three in this paragraph. I want this kind of coverage added to and this taken off. I don't need all that stuff tailored to me. It's very easy to do um, the advantages that you have from technology from it. And so it works really, really well with taking market share um, by having lower prices works really well and it works well with a lot of advertising that's high frequency advertising but otherwise you know you don't have to say much you don't differentiate so it's a total commodity type product no one says oh this is the high class um uh, auto insurance this is the low class this is the one that has the great customer service and this one has the lousy one it's is it okay all right is it the lowest price have i heard of it before and there's a lot of satisfying in terms of like um 
I think I've heard Geico and Progressive are okay from people. I don't think they're going to go out of business tomorrow. Their price looks good. If you got a quote from someone else that you'd never heard of and it was a little bit lower than Geico or Progressive, would you go with them? Maybe no. not. But if it was a lot lower, you might. But um, th- th- you just have to be highly competitive in all those sorts of um, categories. And a lot of it's very scale stuff. Okay. Other kinds of insurance are totally different um, because they're sold differently. So, uh, title insurance, there's no price competition. They all basically price the same level. It's basically a cartel that way. Um, a lot of PNC insurance, uh, 70 years ago or something worked about the same way. Um, not a lot of price competition, you know, I mean, the brokerage business was regulated with a set price and stuff. So it's, you know, something that you see in some industries and, uh, it's more of obviously the, what they call, um, uh, what you have is marketing that's really marketing to the decision makers who are not the people who in theory are buying the insurance. So again, it's required. The real reason of title insurance is not really, there's two types of policies, but the one is not intended to protect your interest in the property. It's because you're trying to create a mortgage that can be sold, packaged and sold and stuff. And no one will buy a mortgage without title insurance on it. Um, it's very similar to gap insurance and cars and other things. There's all sorts of insurance that protects the collateral for when the lender has a concern about, um, they don't want to take, they want to take lending risk. They don't want to take the risk that, um, something happens to the collateral. So totally different that way. You'll basically make the decision that your lawyer, your real estate broker, whoever's involved in closing and stuff tells you that you should do. And so it's all about winning those people over as a distribution method. And so maybe it may be who can do the most for them, can give the most premiums. Obviously, in some states at certain times, it was bribery and things like that. But it's winning those decision makers over, which is not that helpful in Geico and Progressive. Progressive does help agents in some cases with certain system stuff, but, you know, it's totally different. And then there's different like niche kinds of insurance that are very different from that, highly customized Um, then you have insurance that generates, uh, very high premiums, you know, single premiums that has a huge difference. So Berkshire writes some things like that, that are very large premiums. They can sometimes be upfront premiums and all that. And that's a totally different kind of business that has very low expenses. could be, it's almost like an investment banking deal or something in terms of the structure of it, in terms of the costs of how few people are working on it and how big the deal is. Um, you know, and then obviously the economics of it change too, depending on if you're generating a lot of float and all that. But the the customer decision making is so different in insurance versus other things. Um, and then a big part of it is, of course, do you keep people from um, do you retain them sufficiently? So that's a very big the retention factor. rates. Yeah, um, and we've talked a little bit about that with Geico and Progressive and everything. But the biggest factor in retention rate usually. The biggest factor in retention rate is uh, who the customer is. It's not what what the product is or, um, I mean, it's not what the company is. So although companies claim we have X retention rate, the truth is it's more like our customers are X percent loyal. It's customers are inherently loyal or not loyal, your base, which is actually usually more important than who you are. If you attract the right kind of customers, either loyal or not loyal, then that's who you end up with, but it's not really what you're doing. And then the other thing would be like onboarding type stuff. So usually the first year you lose more people. And then with things like Geico and Progressive and stuff, of course, there's sometimes issues that upset people. And so, you know, like a claims experience and stuff. So when you have a accident, they're much more likely to not renew with you afterwards, either because you actually denied things or stuff, or just they didn't like the process, even though they have no reason to believe Geico's better than Progressive. If they didn't like what they went through with Progressive, they'll switch to Geico, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have that. And and then also billing things and stuff like that obviously changes. Sometimes it's very significant. If you include it as a sub item that's small on a bigger bill that's billed regularly, then you'll have huge retention rates. You know, we talked about HomeServe doing that in France. I think they included on water bills and that was tremendously effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think the retention rates are at banks? they break it out and say what it is. It's a little complicated. We know from some data how low it can be. So for instance, there are these products they're creating um, recently, uh, which are basically, um, it's basically free checking. So 
those sorts of products in the first year, I think, have very high um, customer attrition, right? But then there's other things that I think are pretty low. In general, they're low for banks. But also it's weird because people basically take out money without closing the account and everything. So there's all sorts of ways of gaming mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's pretty. I think it can be pretty significant in the first year, but then after that, it's pretty low. Um, and then it depends on your base of customers and stuff. Some of them do break it down and talk about it. Um, I think we talked a little bit about Frost had discussed it because it was believed to be higher than at some other banks. So, um, and they talked about how much of it is caused by divorce and marriages and uh, moving because Frost only serves Texas and mm-hmm. stuff. So obviously that's a very major factor for them. And, um, and then death and stuff. And they give some indications of that. If they actually break it all the way out for you for how much is due to people dying, you can really estimate it for yourself pretty well how big the factors are when they actually say, you know, an X amount was people dying and stuff, that that was a reason for it. And it obviously depends. I mean, companies have pretty high mortality rates when they're young, but established companies don't have, are actually have greater longevity than people. So obviously of all the research that I did, the, the ones that last the longest are advertising relationships. There are a couple advertising relationships that have lasted probably about 120 years mm-hmm. in the U.S. Yeah, it's crazy. Most don't, but there have been a few. Yeah. Why do you think that is? So talking about like the customer experience, right, and judging you know the customers and stuff. I mean, why do you think that ad agencies the retention rates are so high with their customers? Well, there's a few factors. One, lack of price competition. So they intentionally avoid competing on price versus each other. Now, there's some price saving. There's different things where they promise you that they can save you prices, uh, save you on certain things, uh, uh, save you overall if you consolidate accounts with them and stuff. But uh, there is an effort, say, you know, same as like hedge fund things. You know, hedge fund things for a long time would say this is the price of what it is. Real estate things. It's a cartel thing. They say this is the price and mm-hmm. that's what it is. We don't try to charge a lot more, a lot less than others. If you want, you know, you don't switch based on price. Um, so that's one factor. Um, the other one is integration into the company, which is a very big factor. So a really good example is like I was reading a um, book by some CEO of a, a consumer products company. And he refers a couple times to um, people who are there as, you know, he talks about his team there at this meeting with other people and um, our whatever, you know, our person in charge of the brand or whatever. And what he's actually saying is the person at the ad agency in charge of it. Um, But he's not making a distinction between the fact that the person who's the brand manager is his employee, but the person who has that account at the ad agency is not. Um, you know, and in the same thing, and there had some discussion with something and like the president or the, um, agency is there helping them make decisions and stuff about the brand. So for consumer products companies, it's very important. They see them as part of it. The same that someone might with a lawyer start to think of them as basically, um, uh, part of the company. If they keep working on different deals and things with them all the time, that there's just someone that they use all the time and they don't no longer see them as an outsider accounting, things like that. There's mm-hmm. others. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Make sure to hit the subscribe button, thumbs this video up, leave us a rating and review. If you're listening to us on Spotify, I'm trying to jack up those ratings. Please leave us a rating, hit that five star button. We appreciate all the support. If you're interested in learning more about our money management services, reach out to me, Andrew at focusedcompounding.com. All the information is in the description down below. Thank you so much for the support and we will see you in the next podcast.